Well, thank you very much for this very positive question. Um, I think one of the main characteristics of, of an academic career is that you have a great variety in the activities over the years. So you do teaching of students in an academic hospital, you train the surgical residents, of course you have your patient care, outpatients, you do the operations, you do clinical and uh, translational research, and there is a lot of managerial and, and executive things to, to be organized. Over the years, sometimes there is more focus on teaching, sometimes there is more focus on research, and sometimes in your life there is more focus on management and executive business. So at the end of your career, you have done it all. And yeah, well, so when I was the head of the Department of Surgery in Rotterdam, the number of publications that I produced each year was much less than before that time. So there were years that I produced, let's say, 30 or 40 publications each year. When I became the chairman of the Department of Surgery, the number decreased because you have less time. So it's always a question of where do you put your focus? And at the, at the end of the day, the, the nice thing for me of an academic career is that there is such a variety in activities. And during your life, you can evolve and you get a very great variation in your activities. It wouldn't be boring for me to do my, all my life the same activity. So in this way, you can, you can be flexible and in this way you can combine. But of course, one has to be efficient in order, at the end of the day, to, to get uh, a high number of publications and at the same time do your patient care. So efficiency is also a very important factor, I think. Well, yes, that's, a, that's another interesting question. Yesterday I had the opportunity in the hospital here in Shanghai to see an esophageal resection. And I was very much surprised because what the procedure that they did was a what we call a muscle sparing thoracotomy. And in fact, this is almost the same as the uniportal esophagectomy that you are questioning now. Um, because the surgeons in this country, when they do a muscle sparing esophagectomy, they have their hands outside the chest and they operate through a very small incision. So I'm not aware of any study that has been done on applying the uniportal vats. So this is a nice idea and somebody in the world should start and do the trial, which is, I think, interesting. The port that you can use is, can be this size, but can also be this size. My guess would be that the differences between the uniportal vats and the procedure that I saw yesterday here, the muscle sparing esophagectomy, the differences between the two won't be that, that big. So, yes, it's a good concept. Yes, it should be tested. I'm not aware that anybody it has been tested. But if my hypothesis would be that if you are able to perform a muscle sparing technique with your hands outside of the chest, the difference between the two techniques will be very small. Bariatric surgery is a huge developing thing in the western part of the world. In this country, luckily, there are not so many obese patients. In the western part of the world, this obesity disease is increasing rapidly. It's, it's, uh, it's horrible. So there are, there are several aspects to that. First of all, one should realize that obese patients, obesity drives inflammation. So if you look, for instance, to the cytokines in the blood in obese patients, you will see that in obese patients there is a pro-inflammatory pro status. So patient, obese patients do have a chronic state of inflammation. 
Now we know from several diseases that chronic inflammation induces cancer. For instance, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, chron chronic cholangitis. So many Barrett's esophagus, chronic reflux disease of the esophagus induces adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. So chronic inflammation drives the, the malignant de degeneration. So what you see is that in obese patients, they have a large tendency, an increased tendency, towards the development of malignancies. Now, if you, there are several data indicating that adenocarcinoma of the esophagus is the, the, the malignancy that is mostly driven by obesity. So probably one of the reasons why we see so many adenocarcinoma in the western part of the world is obesity. So obesity drives the malignant degeneration. Now focusing on your question, many patients in the western world now undergo some kind of surgical procedure in order to treat their morbid obesity. There, are, there is a variation. Some people undergo gastric bypass surgery. The problem there is that the distal part of the stomach, while well, those people can develop gastric cancers, is not accessible anymore by endoscopy. So after gastric bypass, you can do an endoscopy, but you only see the esophagus, and you see a very small part of the proximal part of the stomach, and then you see the jejunum. The distal part of the stomach is not accessible for endoscopy anymore. So I've seen now several patients in my practice that do develop a distal gastric cancer after gastric bypass surgery, and those patients are detected very lately, in a very late stage, because endoscopy won't show the distal part of, of the stomach. That's part one. Some other patients undergo a gastric sleeve resection. So in those patients, the, the, the greater curvature of the stomach will be resected. Now, if those patients develop a distal esophageal cancer or a gastric cancer, specifically a distal esophageal cancer, a Barrett cancer, and they have a large tendency towards that, you can resect those tumors, but there is no gastric tube because the, res the gastric tube has been resected already by the gastric sleeve. So in those patients, you, you have to do a colonic interposition, which makes the operation much larger and more, more complex um, because the gastric, bi the, the, the gastric tube reconstruction is not feasible anymore. So first of all, there is a large tendency in obese patients to develop malignancies. And secondly, depending on the type of bariatric surgery these patients have undergone, you will face clinical, clinical difficulties. And this will increase because so many operations are now performed, bariatric operations are now performed. So yes, this will have an impact. And probably in China, in your country, I, I expect that because you are changing your eating habits, uh, probably obesity will increase in your country as well. We are a little bit ahead with this problem, but I, I assume that within 10 or 15 or 20 years, the same problem will happen in your country. Summarizing, um, we have indirect evidence and some randomized evidence that if you perform primary surgery without neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, for instance, so you perform primary surgery in esophageal cancer patients, those patients will probably benefit of an extended lymphadenectomy. We've shown that in the HEVEX trial, that is a randomized trial that we published, I think, in 2002. Um, but after chemoradiotherapy, so after the HEVEX trial, we have performed the so-called CROSS trial. In the CROSS trial, we have shown that if you, don't, if you add chemoradiation prior to surgery, so combined multimodality treatment, you improve five-year survival. 
So far in the cross trial, five years survival improved from 34% in the surgery alone arm to 47 or 48 percent in the combined treatment arm. Now, interestingly, and we have published that as well, there is indirect evidence, it's not randomized, but there is indirect evidence that after chemo radiation, the role of lymphadenectomy is less important. And the reason is that positive lymph nodes are probably very radiosensitive. So many positive lymph nodes are downstaged by applying chemo radiation prior to, prior to surgery. And we see that in our data. In the surgery alone group, more than 70% had positive lymph nodes, whereas after chemo radiation, this was only about 30%. So we have some indirect evidence, and we have published that, that probably after chemo radiation, the role of really extended two or three field lymphadenectomy is less important. But it would be, well, you could argue that there, that there should be performed a new randomized trial, like the HEVEX trial, but now in the era after chemoradiotherapy. Because all the data that we now have is only indirect evidence and not really level one randomized data. But yes, there are more people suggesting the same. Yeah. There are several developments going on. In Japan, people used to apply post-operative chemo. Now they have shown in Japan that pre-operative chemo is more effective than post-operative chemo. So in Japan, people are moving from post-adjuvant post-operative therapy to pre-operative therapy. And they are performing now randomized trial, a three-armed randomized trial, pre-operative chemo one, schedule regimen one, this a slightly different second regimen, and then the third arm is preoperative chemo radio. So in Japan they are currently testing what is best to be given prior to surgery. In China it is still uh, probably it, most of the institutes apply still post-operative adjuvant chemo or chemo radiotherapy. Although this morning there was a very nice presentation of a randomized trial in China indicating that pre-operative chemo radiation is also effective. And it, it's almost copied the data of the cross trial, which was the trial that we did in the Netherlands, where we showed that pre-operative chemo radiation really Im significantly improves long-term survival. In Europe, yeah. uh, in, in, in the western part of the world. But the same seems to be true in your country because the data that we saw this morning indicate exactly the same. Now, the interesting thing is that after the cross chemo radiotherapy, about one out of three patients do have a complete pathological response. So, after neoadjuvant chemo radiation, you do then the operation. You, you ask the pathologist to look for the, for the tumor and he can't find any malignant cells anymore. This, of course, questions the necessity of performing an esophagectomy in every patient after neoadjuvant chemo radiation. So the next step in the Western, at least in my country, now will be we apply chemo radiation, then we perform what we call a, a, a response assessment. And if the patient has a clinical complete response, we start to randomize between standard surgery or what we call active surveillance, a wait and see policy. And only operate the patient if you have proven that there is residual disease. And this is in fact the trial that we just started all patients will undergo chemo radiation. Then we do tumor response assessment. In case of a clinical complete response, 50% of the patients will have immediate surgery and 50% might not need surgery. So they will be randomized to surveillance and only will be operated 
if they develop a residual disease. So this is the next step, and, and we'll see what, uh, what will be the result of this trial. I think uh, coaching young researchers in learning how to perform scientific research is, is very rewarding for me. So learning young colleagues to perform clinical research and translational research and see how they develop in their professional skills scientifically for me is, I think, the most rewarding part of my job. But many other aspects are also very rewarding. But if I had to choose one aspect, I think this is the aspect that I like most. That's nice to see that many of my, of my uh, PhD students now have become, uh, have obtained important positions uh, and are still doing uh, important research. And I love to see that. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that would be my number one reward in my professional career. <laughs>